morning friends thank you for being here and hope your stay here in bombay is quite comfortable and you are enjoying the geo convention center this is a very interesting meeting because this is what we are going to face in day to day life we have problems pre op intra op post op and you have some great stalwarts here rohit om prakash a dear friend dr suven bhattacharya ji our innovator from our country so it's going to be very interesting and interactive it's not a monologue you could stop us and ask questions in between what we have really said is what when the going gets tough the tough gets going we have i'll be speaking on corneal haze and shallow ac dr suven will be speaking on dealing with small pupils his favorite topic the floppy iris will be taken care by dr rohit om prakash he is really good at architecture absolutely microscopic details not just the macro picture dr rohan mehra will be speaking to you on how to deal with brown cataracts and i'll come back again with the femtosecond cataracts each talk would be about 12 minutes with a discussion of 3 to 4 minutes and we have kept 15 minutes in the end for a discussion please feel free to stop us at any point of time suven needs no introduction However, Suen is the chairman Naya Nine Center, Kolkata, gold medalist from the Jipmer, and his Retina Fellowship with from Retina Foundation, invented the famous B-Rex ring that has global recognition. And I hope the Russian import stops, and we don't get Malugin anymore here. Do uh, you know how default happens? But that should happen. Well, I wish him all the best on that. He has evolved, he has grown, he has changed his dimensions on that. and very proud to say that he is there with us multilinguistic can fluently talk in four to five different languages at any given point in time and you wouldn't know which language he is originally or was his mother tongue dr rohit om prakash absolutely a genuine innovator doing a lot of great work in amritsar his conferences are worth attending the the january conference of irsi which we've been missing out because of the covid but some of the best innovative lectures he's got lot of awards at escrs ascrs is the third generation of telmologist and he has grown over the shoulders quite often the legacy goes down but his son also tushya is a very nice ophthalmologist very competent and extremely good invented the new sign for the pcr rupture and the flap motility sign it has to be seen to be understanding day to day life what is a flap motility sign and what is the sign of a pc how to manage many international and national awards i will not take more time on that and of course rohan has just passed out with uh, his fellowship from narayan netralay he is the chairman ckia institute saranpur and third generation of ophthalmologist with his hospital running since 1952 he's won many international and national awards for his work in ophthalmology i'll need you I'll start with my first talk. क्या भी लगाइए आप जरा जी ओके थैंक यू कॉनिल हेज एंड शैलो ए सी the worst scenario that you can have is a big arcus bad cornea one eyed patient extremely shallow anterior chamber huge pregnant cataract which is almost going to the retina anterior chamber which is flattened at the periphery you don't really know how to enter and what is the way to go about with it well thanks for your time for being here for this important session and sparing your valuable time with us of course at any given point of time all of us know that knowledge shared is knowledge doubled and and a geometric progression not an arithmetic progression describes a condition called a cloudy or opaque appearance of the cornea as you can see this could be before starting reach buckler atrophy foster folks you have various kinds of corneal problems and haze which can come a corneal opacity nebulomacular to a leucomerous opacity obstructing your view while doing your surgery how to go about with it how to use chandelier illumination how to go about with you know there was a time when we used to work without any 
trap and blue staining and it should be very difficult. So let's divide the preoperative haze scenarios and the intraoperative and the postoperative haze. When we talk of corneal haze, the only thing as surgeons we are guilty about is, you know, everybody loves to say after any complex surgery, cornea was clear and vision was 6-9 next day. We all love saying that. But said easily, only the surgeon knows how much of heartbeats. You know, we, we generally tell the patient, nahi, kuch nahi acha ho jayega. And the patient, any cataract patient, however dirty it is, a dirty brown cataract, bad endothelial cell count of 1100, uh, bad cornea, shallow AC, huge cataract. But the patient only knows one thing, baju wale ke to acha ho gaya. And they, they, they are not really bothered that how much struggle that you are going through. How to deal with that situation? You know, classically I have this patient, a brown cataract you operated, dirty brown 85 year old lady, you operate, had struggled a lot to operate, took some time, really struggled, sweated it out, increased your coronaries, prop, and you did a great job. But the next day the patient says, Lekin kal to main paper pad sakti thi, abhi nahi pad sakti hu. You know how frustrating it is? Yeah, Everybody is nodding, so we've all gone through it. If I've gone through it, you've also gone through it. And, and it's amazing to tell them, what the hell do I tell you and what have I done for you? We have, we have underrated ourselves to a great extent in our life, unfortunately. Oh, five minutes mein cataract ho jata hai, koi problem nahi hai. Or ghar pe ja sakte hai, kal office mein jayenge. So preoperative haze preparation, most important. Specular and topography. I've learned gradually in life that every patient of cataract, you must do a specular, you must have an endothelial cell count in your hand for your own sake and for the medical legal standpoint. Your sake because you might use uh, lovely techniques, sandwich technique, whatever that you want to use, we'll discuss that further. But for your sake, you must know which cornea that you are going in. You know, even before the army goes into Kargil or whichever area, even Zelensky survived because he had satellite images. He knows where what, what was coming from where. So if you don't know your topography of what's happening to the patient, you will land up into trouble. You will not take the right precautions. So, oh, And the cornea may be relatively very simple. You won't even know. It will hit you. And the patient doesn't understand. In a medical legal case that I have seen in two cases that I've been called for, have been where the endothelial cell count to begin with was a very bad endothelial cell count. So don't economize for the patient's sake. You know, we generally have this thing, paisa ho jayega, kharcha ho jayega. Don't, don't worry about that. They are not going to leave you if you try to save their money. Anterior segment OCT to give you the exact findings of what's happening. Adjusting the illumination and the angle of incidence. That can definitely help you. Intraoperative haze can be in the form of air bubbles, drying of the epithelium of cornea, excess staining with dye, and an intumescent cataract. Postoperative, of course, corneal edema due to high FACO time, mechanical damage to endothelium, desmens detachment, high intraocular pressure. This is something which every surgeon is scared about. What is a surgeon, ophthalmic surgeon, really scared of? Two things, the corneal endothelium and the posterior capsule. These are two dangerous enemies. We try to save at any given point of time these two th things that we can control and we should be able to control. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, CME is post op but intraoperative that I'm really worried. I mean, we are always scared of the, the, the worst day is first post op day. You never know what is in store for you. You've done a clean cut cataract, but your cornea may be hazy. You've done, and your, your, you can have any problem any life. And that's why the surgeons are always on their toes every given point of time. So we'll discuss each one of them. Preventing the haze is, is a very important criteria. You have excellent viscoelastics available, dispersive, dispersive and cohesive. Use them at your discretion. Now you have the Indian versions also. Fairly good, relatively very cheap. Don't economize. If you are doing a rexis in a highly positive pressure, a hypermet uh, hypermetropic patient with a 20.5 or a 21 kind of uh, axial length, extremely shallow AC of 1.8 or something, it always helps that you use a good, good dispersive. Use your mannitol freely. It shouldn't create a problem for you. I have in some small eyes of 19, I have also done a small vitrectomy to reduce the pressure. The first step is that you should have a fairly decent entry. I'm going to show a video where I goofed up and how, what was the message that I wanted to learn from that. We'll, we'll come to that. So use your this viscoelastic freely. Don't hesitate. Don't worry about anything else. End of the day, results matter. Don't worry about the cost. 
and the duo whisk or whichever kind of cohesive whisper, your chondroitin sulfate with uh, sodium hyaluronate available freely from Indian companies. Use them. They are good. I haven't had any problems. I've used them. Uh, this is just to tell you the whisk code OVD and the pro whisk which is available in the market. You don't have to buy. These names have no, no meaning to me. What we are trying to tell you is sodium hyaluronate 1% or 3% hyaluronate with 4% chondroitin sulfate. That's the one which gives you really good depth. It doesn't walk out with you if you're doing a rexis. Of course, in wound architecture, at a, in a case like this, Rohit will explain the importance of what is so important, how well to protect your iris and uh, your structures inside. So the soft shell technique is one of the most easily described and the best technique that works very well. Use your dispersive so that your endothelium is protective. Use the cohesive. Try and work with low fluidics relatively. Don't have too much of fluid coming out of the eye. Work in the bag area and try and get on with your nucleus in whichever technique that you are comfortable with. Here is a case which I want you to see. I'll Here was a case which was uh, classically as I described, extreme high pressure, very small eye, shallow anterior chamber, and what is it that was that we started doing? I'm taking the incision. As you see, as I'm starting to put in, look at that, it's coming out. As you saw that, that is coming out. There is not much place for any viscous or dispersive viscoelastic to get into the eye. Now you know that you start your mannitol at this point in time, if you wish to. Reduce the vitreous pressure as much as you have. Loosen your speculum. Easiest thing is to loosen your speculum. Reduce the pressure on the eye because quite a few of these eyes are deep socket, shallow chamber, small eyes, and to get access, we increase the speculum, we open up the speculum. So do that. Once your incision is there, sorry. Trying to take an incision, taking a deeper incision so that the iris does not prolapse. Important through a, even for the side port that you go through a little longer distance so that the iris doesn't walk out with you while the, when the fluidics start. Ah, sorry. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, So as the incision goes further, try to be a little further away. Hopefully that does not. Now look, look, look at that again. The moment I get in, the viscoelastic starts walking out again with me. Now I'm trying to get into the wound. Now I'm trying at multiple points of time. Now here is where I could get into trouble. I could pull the desmets with me. I can take the iris with me. The iris can walk out. Every time the viscoelastic walks out, I can get into trouble right here and now. Why am I showing you this? What goof ups I made? I just want to show that. That how one should not be going in further with that. Uh, by the time I try to do my rexis, if my iris has started going back, going down, I would have trouble. See, again, I'm not, my, my movement was not very good. Uh, the the chamber was flattening. Again, I'm trying to put in more viscoelastic. I'm trying to get in. Now look at that, four or five times even to get a good grasp because my wrist was not moving. Ultimately, we all realize that while operating, we have learned that it is not just the wrist movement, it's not just the finger movement, it is the wrist movement, it is my shoulder which helps me depending on the socket and the eye. These are things which I have to change my posture, position my chair to see that I get a little easier access and because if the rexis runs off at any given point of time, I'm in even more deeper trouble. So I change my position. I change my, my wrist position. I change my finger position. I'm a left-handed surgeon, so my thing might be ultra for you. Uh, I'm a rexis person, not a needle. Again, finding it difficult because there is not much access that I had. This is where if things can go haywire and my rexis runs away, 
I can be in trouble, so I'm going very, very slowly. And like a hero, I decided to do it on the topical. As you can see, the eye is moving. I would have been better off had I given a pinky ball pressure with a retrobulbar or a peribulbar. I'm refilling the chamber again because if the chamber, chamber shallows, <clears throat> your axis becomes smaller. And then you have even more trouble because the, the success of this surgery is only on the rexis. If you've got a big, good enough rexis, you will not tear it. You will have good access to your nucleus. And 80% of the success in such cases is from a good rexis. Take your time because that is, if you goof up somewhere, that's, that's the place which will give you trouble till the end, <clears throat> including phimosis in the end. Okay, look at the iris trying to come out from my wound. Already anticipating trouble because I go with the FACO, with the fluid right now, I might create more trouble. Now, as I put fluid, I'm not sure, there's a lot of, the whole bag is extremely, extremely tense. It's not moving. There are capsulocortical adhesions here. I can't put in more fluid because I'm worried that I might rupture the posterior capsule. There's not enough place for things to escape. The iris is, I mean, the wound is not very friendly for that. Well, fair enough, I managed to enter. And now I have to see that I don't keep coming out. I, once I'm in, I'm in. I have to finish the show and get off only at that time. I haven't had a great amount of movement of the nucleus. I haven't had a hydro, good hydro dissection. But I had to start debulking. The message here was the first thing in a case like this is to debulk, debulk, debulk. Try and remove smaller pieces. You will suddenly get more place in the capsular bag to function. Okay. Some breathing space that you manage to get some space for the nucleus to move. Again, it's not a free movement. And as I said, if your rexis was smaller, you could get into trouble because you're not concentrating on uh, your rexis margin. Trying to be at the level of the new, below the iris plane, not trying to get fluid too much into the anterior chamber. Moving the later part, I'm still with the phaco probe inside the eye. I don't want to come out, as I said, because the moment I come out, the viscoelastic will walk out, the iris will walk out. All possible techniques that you learned, stop and chop, chop inside to whatever that you wish to do, but this is where you'll have to keep moving, debulk, remove fragments, small pieces by pieces. You may not know the extent of the epinucleus also. So now comes an interesting phase where the epinucleus is stuck. You have capsulocortical adhesions and you want to go ahead and remove it. Go ahead. What I do here is more of hydro dissection, subluxate the epinucleus into the anterior chamber if I can or just out of the bag and then catch it by the neck and go ahead with the next part. Uh, this was to show you my mistakes which I made where you should be avoiding how can we tackle smaller eyes with smaller anterior chamber, uh, small axial length. Look at this case. Here I have, as I told you, if you can see very clearly, bad cornea, big arcus, huge cataract, uh, small pupil, patient with uh, prostate medication, so the iris is not going to be good with you, one-eyed. Tell me what more trouble do you want in life? from a surgeon's standpoint. Look at the anterior chamber at the angle, it's closed. The whole thing is, the sh look at the ch size of the anterior chamber. So well, that's how it is. So here was, this is a case where I would say Femto can help you because if you have a rexis good enough, you can go ahead and you have a nuclear plate which is broken and fragmented. It can make, look at on the side, if you can see the anterior chamber is just not there at the periphery. The iris is touching the cornea. There is hardly any place for you to work. So go ahead and adjust. And as you do that, it will help you 
on a femto look at how big the cataract is as i said it's almost going to the retina that's how big it is and this is a one eyed patient brown cataract so a nightmare for any surgeon but once you have a rexis you have a decent exposure to the nucleus you have a fragmented nucleus which when you go in becomes a lot more easier for you to eat it up and you have a little more respect for the iris at that point in time now if you have a corneal opacity you can have a retro illumination or a side illumination which can help you to judge <clears throat> with a trypan blue staining of the anterior uh, capsule look at the opacity look at from the side chandelier that you can have the the important thing again i repeat at any given point for any opacity otherwise for any good cataract surgery is a great rexis great rexis no question about it so this is why i wanted to show you where all i goofed up what i could try and avoid which are situations where we could do uh before i call upon suven for his talk any questions that you have on this pre op intra op post op corneal haze yes sir ji sir so i second third fourth fifth is opinion every patient that i do every patient i have an as oct i have a posterior segment oct i have a fundus photograph and i'll tell you one more step that i do sir how many of you with me agree that patients post operatively come and tell you that mera ek aankh chota ho gaya very good how many of them tell you that black circles have started seeing so how many of them tell you that nahi nahi puffiness bags then wrinkles लेकिन यहां तो अपने को ब्लेम करता है आपकी सर्जरी के बाद ही दूसरा मैं क्या बोलता हूं उनको प्लीज रिमूव योर ओन कैमरा गिव मी योर कैमरा शो मी वन ईयर बैक पिक्चर of your own picture from your camera baad mein samajhta hai ha ha but they make it very serious issue as if you have done everything for them so i agree all comes after the vision is 6 yes after the vision is 6 the vision is 6 by 9 for the baaki sab photo uh yes any other questions you know post op haze we all know that we are worried so minimum feco time that we must be having so and i am ready whenever you are ready so minimum feco time that we can we can have as much as possible stay away from the cornea use dispersive cohesive viscoelastic and dr subira welcome thank you for the show any any comments please welcome dr neha thank you for coming in any any points please do mention any time uh, we will discuss this even further because all that we are all talking is what affects all of us day in and day out साउंड तो नहीं नहीं द साइज ऑफ योर साइड पोर्ट एंड द स्पेशन व्हिच यू मेक फ्रॉम द साइड शुड बी पॉइंट साइड इट शुडंट बी बिगर एम आई राइट गो एंड प्लीज एक्सपेंड यू यू कांट से बेटर देन यू आर शोइंग दैट नाउ ओके सो दिस इज समथिंग व्हिच इज अ वेरी प्रैक्टिकल पॉइंट हाउ आइरिस योर मैग्नेटिक आइरिस डजंट कीप कमिंग आउट ऑफ द पॉइंट दैट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इज दिस पॉइंट कैन ऑलवेज बी रिकॉर्डेड यूजिंग अ सिस्टिक ऑफ फॉर क्रिएटिंग अ रेसिस्टिव ऑफ दैट वुड Shopping. That's another very good point. Yeah, I wanted to show this. Ah, where I go? I wanted everybody to learn 
criticize me badly, this is where we all will learn. No, no, I <laughs> constructive criticism. I will learn from that. So, so that could have. Uh, yes, appreciate. Yeah, that's right. I'm ready, I'm ready. I just, since uh, Dr. Himangshu is allowing us 12 minutes, it's a luxury. So I am just trying to hear. So I'm just, uh, some slides which I had hidden, I'm unmasking. Uh, yeah, so good morning, everybody, again uh, for the third time this morning. And I will be speaking on small people. Like I just said, uh, am I audible? Yeah. So if you have not heard this talk or seen this talk, in the last two days, you've not been attending the conference because this is the third time I'm speaking on this <laughs> in different halls. <laughs> Sometimes in the same hall as back to back in this particular case. Yeah, we can't have enough of you. Oh, thank you yeah, so we much. I love it. <laughs> Who doesn't like, like it? Who does? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a new one. <laughs> Though it doesn't, that word doesn't suit you very much. Anyway, chill. So it's all about anticipation. I'll, I'll try to keep it interactive and you can, because we have 12 minutes, so you're free to ask questions. Uh, I'll be happy to answer. I do have a financial interest in the BHEX, uh, so no way will that come in the way of academics. So the problem with small people is when the pupil size is reduced to half, the surgeon's viewing area is reduced to a quarter. And if the surgeon can't see the cataract, it's a disaster because you can't operate safely. And again, I always say that you need to ask yourself every time it's a call that you need to take a uh, judgment call. If you were the patient, we've all burnt our fingers. We've taken that call, not taken that call in the right time. We've delayed it. We messed it up. We've damaged the iris. We've had a bad situation, complications. So if you were the patient, what would you ask for? A skilled surgeon with no device or the surgeon use the device anyway? So it's a four millimeter people, you're on the table, your eyes on the, on, under the knife, what would you want? So put yourself in that position and then probably think about the patient, it helps. So a lot of us say, nahi, this is six millimeters people, this may the IFS nahi hoga. Mm, I'm definite. Well, this is the paper published in 2011. Seven millimeters people or less without alpha blockers, the risk of IFS exists. And we've all seen that. We've all seen people suddenly comes down on you, out of the blue, you don't know what's happening. And that is the list. The risk, the risk of IFS and the causative agents, uh, the risk is actually endless. This is an abridged list. That's the list of drugs and hypertension, chronic heart failure, diabetes. These are all risks for IFS, and every other patient of ours has this. So it is unpredictable. Let's come to terms with that. And fortunately, now th surgeons have reduced their threshold. We have become result oriented. So we need to know that IFS is unpredictable and there are patient expectations are absolutely exacting and they like they said they are we they are talking of the bags under the eye and they are blaming you for that they're not come to you for vision that is now said become second priority and so unforgiving nature of uh, premium lenses toric lenses multifocal as you don't want people coming down on you you're already under stress so use a disciplined approach have your devices in stock treat every eye as a potential ifis candidate use the viscoelastic judiciously Dr. Himangshu shows that. Uh, I would always strongly recommend that you distinguish between uh, elastic and a non-elastic pupil. That's something which I have learned and I've tried to teach people and I hope people are understanding these days that they are, these two are very different animals. So how big we want the pupil to be, we always want the pupil to be very big and uh, that's a psychological factor. Otherwise, we are happy to take up a pupil which is 5.5 millimeters and does not come down. We think, okay, we can get up, get past this. But when we put a iris hooks or we want a pupil expander, we want a bigger. It's just in our mind. Heart cataract has a big, bigger pupil. Hmm. So choice of pupil device is totally individual. I'm not uh, advocating for or against either. But OVD or iris hooks or pupil expanders, I think it's the elasticity of the pupil and how you wish to tear the rigid pupil is what matters. IFS, uh, Dr. Rohit will be talking about it, but I have a take on that. <laughs> So I believe that injecting viscoelastic and inflating the anterior chamber is not is really a counterproductive. You are pushing the iris against the anterior lens capsule. You're plastering it, so you're not leaving space for the device, whether it's iris hooks or pupil expand. So it's best to keep the anterior chamber shallow and inject a little bit of viscoelastic under the pupil margin. That way, the, you lift off that pupil margin and you create space for your pupil device. So keep the anterior chamber a little shallow. Overfilling is going to be counterproductive and use vascular under the pupil margin. 
So this is what actually I went back and when we, we all have seen this. See, we've seen IFS before 2005. Once Chang and Campbell told us about it, we know, okay, this is called IFS. So that was, that's then re they realized, we realized, fine. But what came out of this paper and probably was kind of buried somewhere was unlike the non-elastic myotic people, the IFS people immediately snaps back to its original size following attempts to stretch it. This is one sentence over there in that paper. And I think most of us fail to look into this so closely. While I was working on the BX and trying various prototypes, various dimensions, various materials, the, the flexibility, the resilience of that, I had to come to a point where it was a trade-off between the thickness of the material, the, the flexibility of the material. So then I went back and realized that when I used a softer material, in some cases, I was just stuck because the pupil would not budge. It's a rigid pupil. That's when I realized, well, some pace, in one eye, I got away, and the next eye, I didn't. So there was a problem. There was a difference in the nature of the pupil. And that's when I went back and did more literature, literature search and realized that, yes, we need to differentiate. So if it's a rigid pupil, you need to work. So small pupils are two types, the elastic pupil or the non-elastic rigid pupil. We have to be very clear about that. The elastic pupil is like a rubber band. It's going to stretch. Any device works. It's, it's open to stretching. The non-elastic is like a string. You can't stretch it. The circumference is fixed. So you have to tear it. You tear it. If the pupil margin is fibrous. So you need either a bulky pupil expander like the malugin or the eye ring, which is strong, tagla, okay, and can do the job for you. Or you use Kugler hooks to get a controlled stretch by manual. And then you use a, a delicate device like the BX. The choice is yours. We could check the elasticity of the people. It's a very, very simple test. We do it, actually, we don't see it. As soon as you've done, you, uh, done your parasynthesis, just inject BSS into the anterior chamber. Inflate the anterior chamber. If it momentarily expands, it is an elastic pupil. If it doesn't expand or doesn't budge, you know it's a rigid pupil. Ir irrespective of the posterior sinecure. If the posterior sinecure, that's a different thing. But you can release the posterior sinecure and then do that. So if it expands, it's an elastic pupil. You don't have to worry. Otherwise, you just stretch it. Don't have to go limbus to limbus. Just enough, about 4.55 millimeters. You make it favorable for using a device. Even if you're using iris hooks, I would say you do a bimanual stretch, get a control. You have a much better cosmetically looking pupil the next day. And do not stretch the pupil beyond 5.5, even if you're using iris hooks. There's no point. So mechanical dilatation of the pupil, knife is, is useless. Do not stretch. I mean, when I say so mechanical, it's stretching. And for rigid pupils, yes, it, is, it has a place. And you could use whatever you are fond of, iris hooks or pupil expansion devices, the malignant ring or the BHEX. So <clears throat> a few things about the iris hooks. So I prefer, I mean, this is a very old video. I have stopped doing hooks for a very long time. There are surgeons over here who do much, a much better job than me. But I prefer to small things, which I learned that time was keep a, make a small conjunctival mark over there because if you're using clear corneal incision, you won't be able to find that paracentesis of yours. And then you hook it, make sure that the stopper is retracted far behind because it becomes very embarrassing. You put that hook inside and then you say that the stopper needs to, be go, needs to go back. That's a lot more manipulation. Do not retract fully. This is an over-retracted pupil. That's the tendency we had in those days. Stretch it as big as you want, as you can. And whenever you're insert, inserting instruments in the eye, remember that the pupil margin is at an elevated anterior plane. It's at the limbal plane. And often the pupil margin is antiflex. So every device that goes in, side port instrument that goes in, you need to take care that you go around that pupil margin. So taking out is no big deal. Actually, people use various maneuvers. Just retract that stopper a little bit, advance that hook, and just pull it, yank it out. That it's a proper polypropylene or nylon, and it'll just stretch momentarily. You don't have to twist it, turn it, and all that heroics. You don't have to do all that. There is a downside to iris hooks. That's the reason I think people are moving to people expanders. Those who don't find a downside, it's perfectly all right. Please continue with your iris hooks. It's all very subjective. So there is a definitely a theoretical risk of infection with multiple incisions. Uh, iris sphincter tears is a reality. We tend to over-retract. We definitely tend to over-retract. And if you look at it, all our work is within the capsular excess margin. We are not going to work outside that capsular excess margin. That five millimeters capsular excess. So why do you want those corner spaces? It's absolute waste. Your anterior chamber is becoming a little shallow. So if you have uh, already shallow AC to start with, you have again raised the iris to the limbal plane. So you have a shallower AC, you're cramped. The chances of iris trauma and endothelial damage again are increased. 
and the time is increased. Now, you, can be, you may be very competent and everything. It has been proven in a publication that iris hooks take more time than a pupil expander, and uh, the time taken for consultants was 14 minutes more, and for uh, trainees was 24 minutes, so that's a lot of more time which could have been saved. And of course, you could have uh, permanently dilated people with terrible glare and an unforgiving patient is not going to be very happy about it. And cosmetically, nobody wants to see this first day post-op. Or maybe, not first day, actually, doesn't, doesn't show up on first day post-op. This shows up on three days, three months post-op. And that, at that time, it looks very ugly. So one of the devices that is available is BHEX. It's a hexagonal device which notches and flanges. And you have tabs for holding. That's a seven minute, I think, yeah. So. Uh, it's a very thin device, as thin as a human hair, so uh, uh, you can, once you use it, you'll realize it's, it's super thin. It's a very simple design, user-friendly, no rocket science, affordable. In fact, the design is deceptively simple. I would strongly recommend that you see a few videos before you first use it, because there are surgeons, especially, I've had key opinion leaders who are actually great surgeons, who came back and told me later, I got fooled by the design, and went in for my first surgery, thinking, ah, that's Mirabai Hatka Kele. So, and then when they didn't find it very comfortable, they went back and saw a few videos. Then they saw, yes, it's really Bai Hatka Kele, if you have seen a video before. Okay, so it's, it's very simple, but you need to see videos in advance. So the advantage is it's in a housing, it's preloaded, it's available sterile at the incision. You just need to hold it with the forceps, uh, BX forceps, and take, carry it into the eye and tuck the flanges, a very simple forceps using is no big deal for us. And the ha housing is transparent, so it allows you visibility through the entire passage, entire travel of the device. You see the device, it's under your control. You're holding the flanges, you're not leaving the flanges at any point in time. When you're using a device with an injector, you have no clue what's happening inside. It could be twisting, turning, you don't know how it's going to come out. So, or get in for that matter. So if we compare the B-hex with the Malugin ring, I mean, that's the, the uh, standard of care, apparently. So, you have scrolls over there, you have notches and flanges over here, and it is one tenth the thickness of the malignant ring at the corners. And uh, if you have a shallow anterior chamber, actually, your sh chamber is shallower uh, the, in the center, you're practically at half depth. So, you must understand the periphery. Actually, it's at the periphery, you're half depth, mid periphery of the anterior chamber, you're half depth of the central anterior chamber. So, if your ring is going to be in the anterior chamber at one point in time, you will be knocking the endothelium. So be, be mindful of that. In a shallow antechamber, you need a very thin device. And uh, here, the uh, entire device is in a single plane, so, and the iris can be bent harmlessly, we know that. How big do you want the pupil to be? Now, when we all started surgery, heart cataract, we wanted big and huge. It's heart cataract, it's a big nucleus, it's gonna come, I think it's, you're, gonna, you're gonna fragment the nucleus. You're gonna make it, take it out piecemeal. So why do you want a big, big pupil? You're not making, doing an SICS or something. Even in SICS now, people are fragmenting it and then taking it out. So why do you need a big pupil? So a 5.5 pupil is adequate for any grade of cataract. We need to take up, when we do routine surgery, if we take up a 5, 5.5, I might get away with this, so I won't use a device today. Hmm. But when you put a device, you want it. Value for money, no? You realize the value for money. <laughs> So, this is a hard cataract. Deepak Meghur, of course, he's a skilled surgeon. He's a great educator, great friend. Less than four minutes, a little bit of stretch. And three flanges tucked, alternate flanges tucked. This is a 5.5 pupil. That's all it is. It's a very hard cataract. Just chop it into as many small fragments as you want. It's going to come out. Your capsular excess is not seven millimeters, isn't it? When you're doing a FACO. So why do you want the pupil to be at seven millimeters? So that's a simple logic. I think, I first, I think I'll leave that to Dr. Rohit is going to speak about that, but just I'll go to one slide. Uh, sorry, we'll skip this. So one slide over here, which I, I feel strongly about, is there are two components, meiosis and iris prolapse. For meiosis, iris hooks, pupil expanders, perfectly all right. They provide constant pupil size, good visibility, safe FACO. That's all you want for the meiosis part. Iris prolapse, nothing works. Nothing works. That day, that iris, your luck. <laughs> Severe iris, iris is going to prolapse out of every port. Every port, okay? So, if you got away 
with IFS in with the particular device, no credit to that device. Your nasib that day. Okay, as simple as that. Okay, let's get clear about. So what you want is a good visibility. Forget about the iris blur; that will keep prolapsing. It, it, you might have a torn and tattered iris, but what you want to do is get away with that cataract surgery. So if you have good visibility, you want you're safe. So any device will do that. So thinner the device, the better it is. I believe something which requires small incisions, has a low vertical profile, can exit through the side port. So the iris hooks and the BHX would, I think, fit the bill over there. They, they check all the boxes. Look at this. This is a, a one millimeter side port or 9.9 .9 side port, and I'm using the BHX. I'm taking it out through a side port. No device could, no, no people expander in the history of ophthalmology has been able to do that. So, and in tight situations like IFIS, shallow AC, it works very well. Intraop meiosis. Now, this is another situation I'm very keen uh, about. So, when you're using a malignant ring or an eye ring, the iris, pupil margin engaging parts on the side. So, it's like this. So, the pupil margin is over here. You can, you get a top view. You can't see what's happening over here. So, with the BX, it's like this. The notches are facing you. And as you hold that flange and tuck it under the pupil margin, carry it to the periphery, you have instant confirmation that you've not engaged the capsular excess margin. If you have engaged, you come back a little and again disengage. You have control over that flange throughout. When you're using a device with an injector, you have no control over that and you don't know what's happening while the pupil margin or the capsular excess margin is getting engaged. So that is a huge threat. That's a huge threat. Shallow anterior chamber. 75 microns, that's the thickness of the BX. And you just, and this was a complicated uh, shallow anterior chamber. And like that's Deepak's uh, preferred side port. Most of us prefer the side port because it, in a shallow anterior chamber, you won't like to go to the main incision that will shallow the anterior chamber. CTR being used, no, no problem. So as long as you have a constant pupil size, I think most of us are very comfortable doing surgery. Taking out always is very easy. This is a video which is available. It's a matter of big honor for me. It's available on the American Academy website. It's a very difficult surgery, a glaucoma tube shunt in place. No device can you manipulate like that around that tube shunt. Single incision, all the three flanges engaged. Look at what he's doing. That is the third flange, and it's going around that tube shunt to engage the pupil margin. No device can do that because you have control at the site of action by the forceps jaws. You do not have that kind of control with any other device. We have become slaves of technology in some ways, which is actually, we don't look at our interests. When you're using an injector, everybody, I'm, I've, I've faced this for a very long time. Fortunately, now people have learned. So many people ask me, don't we have an injector for the BX? Why? Because the Malugan has it. Okay? Do you do everything that your neighboring surgeon does? So think for yourself. The injector tube over here was in, it was because the Mulligan ring is a biplanar device. It is going to snag the incision while going in and while coming out. It's a biplanar device cannot go in through a slit incision. It is going to get stuck. So the injector was made to circumvent that problem. And when you use an injector, you are losing precious inc incision space. We are working on small incisions. So the injector tube wall has a thickness. You're losing space over there. Why do you do that? And the forceps is so much easier. Then there was an argument that, well, you were using, uh, see, it's sterile. You're de delivering the device sterile. There's no conjunctival touch. Oh, is that so? So your phaco probe, sleeve, what's happening to that? There is no conjunctival touch when you're going in. So we have become slaves of the West sometimes, and we don't think ourselves. So better, better start applying your mind to what you want. This is a femto phaco, Ajayapal, doing it. 4.1 pupil, and uh, the pupil comes down, and go ahead with the femto, and now once the pupil has come down, now you have, uh, femto also is known to cause a little bit of meiosis, about 1 to 1.5, that is there in the literature, most surgeons believe it doesn't now, but then after a femtofaco, I think your capsular excess is a little delicate, so you would prefer to use a device which you have more control over. That's your choice again. <laughs> so it's pretty easy after that. So that's the lens going in. 
actually, uh, my good friends have done more surgery and more variety of surgery than I have. I don't have access to a femtof laser, FACO, so uh, they do it. So intraop meiosis, yes, be, uh, it's either the iris hooks or the BX ring. Subluxated cataracts, I would always use iris hooks. There is no doubt about that. Uh, I will always use because I can do asymmetric pupil expansion in the particular quadrant of the clock hours that I want. I'd encourage you to look at this particular uh, PDF, which is available on our website. It's got useful video links throughout. It's, I think, a lot, eight pages. And it all tells you all about the BX, all that I've spoken, and more. And this is about fake emulsification in small pupils, available on eofta.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, sir, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Suvin. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to let him go. No, we'll, I'll be we'll here. We'll have a discussion. I'll be here. Uh, Rohit, uh, Rohit, again, needs no introduction for the new crowd which is coming in. Uh, he has a lovely IRSI conference at Amritsar in January. One of the most prolific, high-volume surgeons, extremely great human being. Man with micro-understanding about the subject, he can dissect it to smaller levels, and you always thought, why did I not think about it? We're going to have him here. Rohit, pleasure to have you and an honor to have you. Thank you, Dr. Himanshu, for calling me over in this. When the going gets tough, it's the tough gets going. I would be speaking on a different aspect of intraoperative floppy RA syndrome. But I feel that you know we should initially try to understand the intricacies involved in this intraoperative floppy RA syndrome. And we can obviously take the help what Dr. Suvain has been talking about. So intraoperative floppy iris syndrome is what I'm going to talk about. So we have, to, we have to realize that there are different causes of iris prolapsing. One is the pos positive pressure, which can be because of exogenous causes, endogenous causes. Then there can be iris challenges in the form of floppy iris, which can be because of alpha-1 adrenergic blockage. Primarily, it is because of that atrophic iris, chronic use of pylocar, pseudo-exfoliation syndrome, or it can be because of procedural causes. So I would be going into the details for alpha-1 antagonist drugs-related intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. We have to realize one very basic factor, that this blockage of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, which is present in the dilator muscle of the iris, it predisposes to reduced maximum pupillary diameters. Because what happens is whenever the blockage of the dilating muscle is there, the, there's a predisposition to, dis, to reduce maximum pupillary diameter. And whenever there's a prolonged blockage, what happens is that there is a disused atrophy of the muscle, subsequent to which there's a thinning of the dilator muscles. So what we realize now is that with the use of tamsulosin and other drugs which are used for BPH, there is a, a diffuse atrophy and thinning of the dilator muscles. So I've already talked about that, that there's a reduced maximum pupillary size. Now what happens, what is the sequel to the dilator muscle getting thinned out and atrophic? Now what happens is whenever there is a fluid excess to posterior aspect of iris, what happens is, as you compare it with the normal iris, that there is an increased billowing. So the basic concept involved is two things, that whenever there is an excess or, or whatever it is, excess to the posterior aspect of the iris, in a patient wherein the, there's a thinned out and atrophic iris, there is an increased billowing. So billowing is there in these patients. So let's understand the dynamics in iris trauma in normal patients. Now what happens is that in these patients, there's a strong dilator muscle tone. So whenever there's an iris touch, what happens is that it causes some bit of minimal pupillary constriction because the action of dilator muscle action overpass the constrictor muscle action. So a single touch doesn't create an exaggerated response. What happens when there is a repeated touch? When there is a repeated touch, despite that, the pupil still fully doesn't constrict. 
so it is only when the constricting touch constricting action on the muscle is more that the pupil constricts when it overpowers the dilator muscle tone however when we talk of patients who are using alpha 1 antagonist drugs what happens is that there is an exaggerated response to iris touch so whenever there is an exaggerated response what happens now is let's understand that the dilator muscle tone is less a small touch created an ex, you know an exaggerated response and the pupil constricts so ifis has iris billowing as i have already told so whenever there is a touch there is a progressive constriction of pupil and if there is a mismatch there is a tendency for the iris to prolapse so this is an animation to show that there is an there is a billowing and whenever there is a billowing there is a progressive pupil reconstriction and uh, you know iris prolapsing through the incisions which is always there or there when there is a mismatch in the uh, what do you call the ports or incisions so floppy iris or prolapse in it occurs in as high as 57% of patients so now what are the challenges the challenges are that there are some preoperative challenges and there are intraoperative challenges so the first thing your staff and everybody should while they are taking the history we usually add uh, this to the patient's profile that he is using drugs for the control of bph so in these patients we have to realize that it takes a longer dilatation time for the pupil to dilate so you have to give them extra time for the pupil to dilate that's the first thing which you have to do <laughs> then the choice of pharmacomidriasis is very important now the dilator muscle tone is weak so what we use is we use parasympatholytic drugs because it has an indirect action by inhibiting the iris constrictor muscle so in other words we use atropine cyclopentolate tropicamide as we usually use and these sympathomimetic drugs like epinephrine phen phenylephrine they too have a direct action because what they do is they displace the tamsulosin and increase the iris tone so however we have to bear in mind whenever there is atrophy of the muscle this is inefficient like epinephrine and phenylephrine in dilating the pupil to that extent the non steroidal anti inflammatory drug everybody is aware have their required effect in uh, letting the pupil constrict less to trauma during during phacoemulsification one important factor we have to realize is that the pharmacological pupil dilatation as a predictive test for the risk for intraoperative floppy iris syndrome is there and it has been seen that these patients who are taking these drugs for a pupil size 7 mm or smaller the risk for ifis exists regardless of these uh, you know things so now the use of meleguin ring or b hex ring device as dr swain also showed so these were the, this was the study done by david chang and in which he find there is no second thought that the pupil remains 6 mm or 5.5 whatever the size of the ring is throughout the surgery but one important and there is no significant intraoperative or postoperative complication but we have to bear that in mind that 93% of the eyes had moderate to severe ifis so yes meleguin ring and b hex helps in having a consistent 6 mm pupil diameter but ifis moderate to severe still exists so what is the click in it now the click is that we should know the technique how to manage it and what are the finer nuances which are involved in involving a technique so that you know we want three things basically to happen as i've already told we should have le stable chamber settings we should allow less excess of fluid to the posterior aspect of iris third we should there should be least amount of trauma to the iris with these things in mind can you connect the you know i need the volume also this is the one volume ke liye ye yahi lagegi na 
So no doubt uh, we have to be prepared, but knowing the technique so that have you have the least amount of complications this is very important. This video is a stepwise approach in a blue iris patient on tamsulosin for more than 15 years with maximum pupillary dilatation of 4.2 mm. Preoperatively, the pupil needs to be given adequate time to dilate. A micro incision with a long anterior tunnel parallel to the iris is given. A short tunnel can predispose to iris prolapse. So incision is very important. So the first step is the incision. A calibrated sideport incision with a 25 gauge needle is made. This provides additional anterior chamber stability, atraumatic surgery and minimal fluid access to posterior surface of iris. I saw videos across, if you go across the videos across the world on YouTube of intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. If you dissect them, you will find that mostly it is initiated because of mismatch in the side port. Because these patients are really predisposed to constriction of pupil with the least amount of touch. And it is basically the side port which is not being taken care of and which is creating all these 25 hassles. gauge needle creates 500 micron diameter incision. The shaft of the chopper is fashioned between 400 to 450 micron from the distal to the proximal part. This provides adequate sinking in shape and size allowing easy manipulation in interior chamber. The long thin tunneled incision decreases predisposition to iris touch and frequently makes the incision self-sealing. There is no change in pupil size and no excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iris thereby minimizing the chances of billowing and progression of IFIS. Non-calibrated side port incision causes IFIS with disproportionate efflux of fluid, unstable interior chamber, excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iris and iris prolapse. Intracameral epinephrine is used to dilate the pupil. Epinephrine is more effective in early stage when receptors are blocked. However, in this advanced case, due to muscle atrophy, there is less metriasis. In dilated pupil size less than 4.5 mm, a dilating aid can be easily used. In this case, viscodispersive OVD is injected over the sub-incisional iris followed by injection in the remaining part. Urshnoff's dry soft shell technique for OVDs includes using viscodispersive over the iris, viscocohesive in the pupillary area with PSS below the viscocohesive with use of low parameters. OVD injection has to be guarded as overinflation can cause iris prolapse. Capsulorexis is done with forceps through micro incision. The plane of the forceps is kept close to the capsule for control. Cystitome also helps with enhanced chamber stability. Slow hydrodissection is done as vigorous hydrodissection can cause iris prolapse. Low fluid parameters are used. Low IOP nuclear emulsification is carried out to provide staple chamber settings. Continuous irrigation is not used. The irrigation is stopped and then the tip taken out. Keeping irrigation on while removal of tips predisposes to iris prolapse <coughs> and IFIS. Nuclear chopping of grade 2 to 3 nuclear sclerosis is done using selective use of vacuum at deeper plane to allow firm gripping of nucleus. The aim is to chop into small nuclear fragments with total separation. The separated nuclear fragments are left in C2 till we achieve totally separated nuclear fragments.
This helps in providing stable interior chamber and capsular bag and decreased excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iris. Firmly gripped hard nuclear fragments are brought at the level of interior capsule. Nuclear emulsification of the hard fragments require higher fluid X. The emulsification is done in the center and in the proximal half of the pupil to avoid inadvertent emulsification of iris. The central position helps in avoiding aspiration of viscodispersive OVD used in this case. Irrigation and aspiration is done using a curved coaxial tip with sleeve highly retracted to separate the plane of irrigation and aspiration. The vacuum is not increased below the iris to avoid inadvertent trauma to the iris. The vacuum is increased after fixing the cortex and bringing it in the center and the tip is not angled downwards. Bimanual irrigation and aspiration can be the preferred technique depending on the surgeon's choice. The separation of plane of irrigation and aspiration helps in stabilizing the interior chamber and preventing excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iron. Well, decoding, so we should know the technique, that's the first most important thing. We should have... We have, we have till 11.55. You are making a mistake. So we have enough time. Thank you. We have we have two more speakers. Don't worry. We have we yeah. have yeah. <laughs> could have. yeah. No, no, that's so okay. So I'll just summarize. We should yeah. know the technique. A traumatic surgery is the first thing. Use sympathomimetic drugs to your advantage. Viscomidriasis has to be done as I've already ex explained. Decrease excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iris. Have stable chamber settings. Use calibrated side port zion low IOP FACO, no predisposition in patients using alpha antagonist drugs, use pupillary dilating aids, maybe five, maybe six, whatever you are comfortable with. If you have an associated, uh, uh, what do you call, pseudo exfoliation syndrome, you can use it for even smaller, for even larger pupil. Most importantly, know the technique, uh, calibrated side potency and use sympathomimetic drugs to your advantage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, that was really enlightening. As I told you, friends, small, small points which can make your life a lot more easier. And very important that you do it at the right point of time. These small points which he mentions can go a long way in improvising your surgery. Rohit, that's a question for you. For the side port, you said a 25 number needle. Correct? Correct? Yeah. So would that mean that any universal chopper or something which is available would go through that? Or is it made by specially you have my, my marked your own. No, no, no. It's the f concept is that it has to be titrated to your side port instrument. Correct. The side port instrument which I was using, I found that I can. I found that it was 400. And the uh, side port incision size was uh, calibrated accordingly. So it is not 25 gauge. It is whatever the incision is that has to be calibrated to the instrument what you are using. Correct. So that's I what I wanted to tell the I friends I that I you I find I out your instrument yeah. port is what size. If it is 23 it gauge needle, don't go with an MVR 20. You yeah. know, generally we have yeah. the ins so I have, you know, just adapt. The sister gives you 25 number, you go in with that. But now you are asking for trouble. So gauge your thing, titrate your uh, instrument, and that is what he's trying yeah. to say. No mismatch has to. No be mismatch should happen, and that's why. So we have our next speaker, Dr. Rohan Mehra. He is uh, trained with Shankar Netrala in cataract refractive surgery and is managing uh, a clinic with a huge OPD, third generation ophthalmologist, doing a lot of dynamic surgery in cataract and refraction. He is going to talk to us uh, today. Yeah, come. Come over, Rohan. Thanks.
So I'll tell you what. Actually, the when you say that the uh, side port, you have to measure that keep the side port incision rate. Dr. Rohit said, to the extent that your chopper goes in about seven to eight millimeters into the eye, Absolutely. that is where the cracks because the the diameter is slowly increasing from the chopper tip till the sh angle. Okay, where the, the shaft is bending. So you have to have it. You have to go at least seven to eight millimeters into the eye to do a good chop. You have to have that amount of flexibility. So. Absolutely. And if you have a longish side port, then you're going to have overlocking. So that is something you have to keep in mind. So if it's a s narrow, if it's a narrow side port, it has to be short too. Depends. 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 So because. So long as you can manipulate. Yeah. Because distortion, otherwise there will be distortion. Exactly. goes below the iris is more important. So just a thought, is it possible that we rotate our irrigation 90 degree than what we normally do? So it is facing up and down rather than facing on the side. No, uh, Will I'll it I'll help I'll or I'll not? I'll like to disagree over there. The billowing does not happen because of fluid going under the iris. The billowing happens because of the stream of fluid flowing around on Bernoulli's principle. Right, sir. Right. Sir, sir but, but the amount, so the Bernoulli principles again will apply in the direction of the fluid. So, yeah. suppose this, I, yeah. I don't know that, uh, what will happen in the eye, it is just a thought. So, when we put it up and down, the amount of turbulence should reduce. This is what I feel technically, whether it is practical or not, I don't know. You sir. see, it, yes, you are right to some extent in that, but the, the thing is that once you, it's in a closed space, if your fluid is circulating, so it's in and out. So there is a stream created. So any which way you send the fluid, yes, the initial gush may be vertically towards the cornea and back to the iris. Okay. So there's another uh, flip side to it that you're hitting the iris probably directly. So you're initiating a wave. You're initiating a wave. Thank you, sir. I'll finish in seven to eight minutes. So I'm going to be talking on how to break the brown cataract. And literally the brown cataracts are so hard that uh, one really needs to take out your chainsaw to be able to break them. Most important thing is you cannot be choosing the wrong tool. That is your second instrument. You cannot be having your soup with a fork. You need to have a spoon to have your soup. Effort plus wrong tool will give you zero results. So you're going ahead with your perfect settings, the best of machines. If your second instrument is not correct for a hard brown cataract, it will not break. So get the right tool for the right job. Now this slide shows what I mean by the right tool. You need to have the second instrument. It can be a sharp or a blunt chopper, but the the edge that is there ahead has to be longer because you know that in a brown cataract, the lens thickness is going to be bigger. And till the time you don't crack the core of that nucleus, 
you will not be able to take it out easily. Multiple choppers are available, sharp, blunt. You need to choose for yourself what is suiting in your hand. So experience is a double-edged sword. I always say that and I live by it. What happened with me was I always used to use a blunt instrument for all my cases. I switched to the sharp chopper and I cut my anterior capsule once. Once the anterior capsule got cut, since that day I never picked up that sharp chopper. But that does not mean that I cannot take it up again. So since I've had a bad experience, that does not mean that I cannot take that sharp chopper again. So always you need to keep innovating, you need to keep trying and testing what is suiting in your hand the best. Uh, just look at this gentleman, the right technique, huge rock, huge rock, he knows where to hit it. He knows exactly where to hit it and it will break into two. Imagine trying to break this rock into two by any other method, the machine, the bulldozers, and this guy is doing it by hand because they know exactly where to hit it. What happens on a lot of occasions is, as I said, what we are using, we get used to it and we don't want to use something which is better available. Too busy for, for improvements, that's not the answer. You have to keep innovating, you have to keep trying things. So here's a case, a hard brown cataract. Uh, you've got to make sure that you get a good rexis. Once you have a good sizable rexis, that's only half the job done, especially in a brown cataract. What one needs to make sure is that a hydro dissection is done and it's a freely rotating nucleus. Once it is a freely rotating nucleus, uh, your maneuverability increases manifolds. Uh, preferred technique, Again, it could be a direct chop or it could be a stop and chop. Most important thing is that the core, the center of the nucleus has to break. If you keep breaking the periphery of the nucleus, you will struggle once you reach the core. The periphery you'll be eating up and the core will be left behind. So once you're separating, you see, you have to keep going from the periphery to the center. You have to make sure that the center of that cataract is separated. Your hold is there, the hold of the phaco from the vacuum stays. And till the time my center has not been split, I have not moved my nucleus, I have not rotated it uh, so as to get further cracks into the nucleus. The core has to come out. So th this is one technique. The alternate technique is of course a flower petal technique wherein you keep cracking the periphery and you take the central goodly as they say of the nucleus and you eat that first. Once that central part of the nucleus is out, the periphery becomes easier. But that technique needs a lot of experience. As a beginner, you must, you must try and crack the central part of the nucleus. Once that is done, rest of it becomes easier. And there is no set thing that you have to make only four quadrants. You can make six, you can make eight, depending upon how hard that nucleus is. So rest of it is uh, remaining the same. You keep rotating, keep making smaller pieces. The smaller you make them, the easier it's going to get for you. Also remember, it's a hard brown cataract, a big cataract. So in case a big piece is left, there's a high chance that a phaco salute will happen in the last piece. That will bring pressure onto the posterior capsule and it might break. So this is another um, case in which it is intumescent. So you first go in and you try and uh, reduce the amount of uh, pressure inside the lens. Once that is done, you will see, once the nucleus is made in the, uh, the rexis is made in this case, that there is a brown cataract underneath. In younger people, generally, when you get these white cataracts, they are softer. But in older people, when you get these white cataracts, underneath this rexis is lying a hard brown cataract. So few points here, because it is an intumescent cataract, it is very easy for you to be uh, able to run this rexis out. So always be careful, make sure that your chamber is stable. Now, if you see at this point, at this point my vector has to be correct because it's very easy for me to take this nucleus, uh, the rexis out. Again at this point, your vector has to be correct. Only then you'll get a circular rexis. If that is not, that is the point right at the end mostly when your rexis runs off. So in this case, you see that once you are embedding the tip, the chamber is getting shallow. You'll be able to see that there will be a lot of curves on the uh, cornea. The reason being that the chamber is shallowing. 
once the chamber is shallowing again as sir said it's happening because the side port is not calibrated there's a lot of fluid that is escaping from that side port here again you have to be patient keep trying till again you do not receive a crack in the center core the main part the central core has to be cracked you can keep trenching keep trenching keep trenching till the time your center is not cracked there's a lot of tugging but once you'll be able to receive one crack the rest of them become easier it's the first one that's the most difficult you see again a lot of fluid is escaping from the side port so the chamber is not being shallow but we've got our crack now finally and once that is done now the rest of it becomes relatively easier center has to be cracked that's the message yes yes so all of us are not uh, captain america and we can't uh, do this exactly the way he is doing it with his own hands so we need to get the right tool even he requires a tool to cut it thank you so much thanks rohan you know in in cataract ultimately it is like the britishers divide and rule break the back of the enemy what russia is trying to do what zelensky is not allowing is not allowing him to break the back of the enemy the core the core the core a great rexis deep chamber and well, make it on play 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 so a deep deep rexis and that is where you can get on with your uh, break and get with the brown cataract or a or a yeah just start playing yeah right again here i'm little bias towards certain things femto why it can be a great tool for you and it can help you in your practice i'll just skip out because in the interest of time i don't want to talk about other things i'm not here to promote any machine or anything but how as a friend technology can help you to get you results in various kinds of cases that's all there is a learning curve there is there is various things involved uh, i have less time so i'm just saying that good prediction of predictability of the iol positioning corneal astigmatism and early wow factor image guided assistance it can tell you exactly where are you going and where are you headed so nuclear fragmentation rexis so look at the planning of hard brown cataract now when you are doing that as i said a bad cornea with a bad endothelium here if you are doing your case you want a pre chop nucleus you want a great rexis i keep repeating that that the core has to be broken the rexis has to be good only then that your life will be a lot more easier once you got the hang of it you can go ahead and it will break the nucleus your arcuates majority of patients have some amount of astigmatism 70% of them between 0.75 to 1.25 so a uh, a great arcuate even i'm using a lot of multifocals helps me uh, femto helps me to get great effective positioning of my lens it helps me to reduce my astigmatism it helps me to plan my my main incision and the side port incisions look at a pre chop nucleus which is there you can easily just break it into smaller pieces and eat it, eat them up so your phaco time your fluidics time everything goes down quite well and it helps you there are various nomograms posterior synechia so even if you have posterior synechia you're not sure whether the pupil is going to dilate later but again as i said on a extremely shallow anterior chamber bad pupil once you have access to the nucleus on a fairly decent level you can you can be now look at that we have broken the synechia you have got a rexis going yes the posterior synechia can be broken and good enough that the pupil wasn't ifis kind of a pupil it dilated and i didn't have to use uh, suens uh, iris uh, expander i could go ahead and manage so various cases where you are not sure what you are headed into 
Now you have a white cataract. Absolutely. What, what, what is most important here is, despite doing a femtolaser, you may run off on the side. There could be adhesions. You have to be careful. Never can you take things for granted. You, you have to peel off the rex as well. And you have a fairly fragmented nucleus here, which can help you. Well, despite your best femtos, some hard cataracts cannot break. A bra brown white cataract will not be fragmented, whatever laser energy. So it's your manual skill which comes into play. But you have some access where you are almost sure that you have got into the nucleus well. That is a very important part of the surgery. We have three minutes. OK. Uh, if if, if uh, I can put in a malugin ring in a small, small pupil, and then go ahead and do a femto. So once you put in a ring and you have got in, I borrowed this from uh, Boris with his permission that uh, we are sh we're showing this, how we can use this, close the wound, and go ahead and do your femto, which is fine. Here is, again, another hard cataract, Arcus, big cataract. Ah, this is an interesting case. I must show you. Did you see something interesting? This is an ICL. If you saw, there is an ICL here. This is the cataract. And you can be, you can adjust your, your femto in such a way that with the ICL there, you can still get a good rexis absolutely underneath because it could be a very traumatic experience if you have the, the lens stuck at multiple places, you get bleeding and your iris goes down. So the precision accuracy is something very, very vital to this. A posterior polar cataract. wherein you can have rings, you can have cylindrical parts. Very interesting. You will see that uh, you, are, you have a pre-marked here. On the right side, you can see it, the posterior polar going down below. Once you start your laser, you can, you can make your rexis to your adequate size just in case of the posterior capsule breaks so that you can put a uh, lens on the, in, the, in the bag, outside the bag, in the sulcus area. But look at the cylinders being made by the femto machine becomes a lot more easier to dissect these cylinders and get them off at various points in time. Thank you. I wanted to flip through it quickly so that we can have a few questions. Any, any questions that you would like to? Yes, ma'am. I will like a regular one. You, you, have, you, can, you can calculate your regular IOL power. And if I've done an ICL myself or a LASIK also, I do an A scan and give it to them preoperatively. Yes, sir. Uh, when will I not be able to do a femto? Whenever there is a corneal opacity. Yes. Anytime there is a corneal opacity. If the pupil is very small, then you'll have to use a pupil expander. That, these are the times when. Correct. So the whole capsule is not always thickened. Few areas where it will be thickened. But you have a good access to the capsule. So majority of it, almost 90% of it, you will have a good access. Wherever it is thickened, you will have to be careful and or use your vanas to cut it. If it is really calcified anterior capsule with the cortex on that, then you will have to do that. Yes. Anything else for our learned colleagues here? Yes, we yeah, but thank you all very much for attending and making this a grand success. And thank you, uh, Suen, thank you, Rohit, and thank you, Rohan, for being a part of the IC. Thanks very much.